Hi everybody. Today I would like to discuss a new topic which is work and energy. Uh, in our everyday life we do some work always and uh, this common notion of work uh, gave rise to physical concept of work, the physical quantity. But if in our everyday life we understand what is work intuitively, on intuition level, then in physics we need a strict definition of every physical quantity. So in order to define work, we must just think about it a little bit from physical point of view. Well, imagine I do some work. For example, I move this heavy load, this one, on the surface of the table. Yes, I do some work, and it means that I apply force and move the body with this force. It's obvious that the larger the force applied, the larger is the work done. So the work done in this case, the work is proportional to the force applied. Also, it's obvious that if I move the object just at a small distance, then this action requires small amount of work. But if I move the object at a larger distance, then I will, I will perform larger work. So the work done must be proportional to the distance. The work must be proportional to the distance. That's obvious. That's based on our everyday understanding of work. And from here, we may derive that the work as a physical quantity may be defined as force times distance. And this is the definition of physical quantity work. This is not the final version of definition. This is just the first step to define the work. And from this definition, we see that the work units of measurement, I will put it in this way. This is not the amount of work. When I put this work, uh, the uh, letter in square brackets, I mean that I want to show the units of measurement of work. So work should be measu measured in what? This should be Newton, which is the unit of measurement of force, times distance, which is measured in meters. And this unit of Newton per meters has a special name and special notation. It's a joule. <coughs> it's a joule. So uh, Newton is written using capital character because this is the name of a scientist. Meters is a small character because this is just the name. It's not a name of the scientist. Joule, again, is the name of the scientist. So we must use a capital letter, Joule. But when you, when you uh, want to uh, put this word in writing, when you put this word in writing, uh, you will use capital letter in writing, like this. If you are dis talking about the scientist, about the person, but if you just want in writing to mention the unit of measurement, then it will be a small letter. So if you encounter such a word, this is not the person. This is a unit of measurement. And this is a person. This is his name. But when you use abbreviated version of the units of measurement, then in abbreviated version, when you use only one character, then then you use capital character always if this unit of measurement is named after a person, after a scientist. That is the general rule.
So work is measured in joules, and one joule is one newton per me meter. Now we discuss it in some greater detail. For example, if I take this load and lift it at some height, I will apply force and I will move this load at some distance. So when I lift the load upward, I, I do some work. And according to this formula, the force applied to the load times distance, that is the height, will be the work produced. And if the load is kept at this height, then this work is stored. It's, it does not vanish. It may be returned, and it may be used again later when I allow this load to go down from the initial height. And when the load goes down, it will produce work, obviously, because it, it's, it acts with, with some force on the support. And when the support goes down, the load covers some distance. And so force times distance will be work produced by the load when it goes down. So if I lift uh, the load upward, that will be the work will not vanish. The work may, may be used again later. So let's consider the load of mass M and the gravity pull is Mg directed downward to the center of our planet. And here is the support. And if this support moves up slowly without acceleration, then the force act which is applied to this load will be equal to mg if i if i go up slowly without acceleration then the force applied to the load will will be equal to mg and if i lift the load upward at height h to this new position new position of the support then, according to this formula, I will produce work which is equal to force mg times the distance, which is h in this case. That will be mgh. The work done by lifting a load m at height h. And this work does not vanish. The load may produce the same amount of work when it goes down when I allow the load to go down. So the work done does not vanish, does not disappear. It may be used again. It is stored when the load is lifted upward. The work done is stored. And such a stored amount of work is called the potential energy. Potential because it's potentially available for future use. This energy of a load, which is at height h, this potential energy may be used. And, this is the, and the, the load, when going down, may produce the same amount of work which was done when we lifted the load. That is not always the case that the, that the work done is stored and can be used again. Sometimes the work done is lost. For example, when I move this load on the surface of the table, I, I produce some work, I do this work, but this work cannot be returned. It cannot be uh, used again. The work which I, I, I have done is lost. The load can never produce the same amount of work. It, it will never move by itself. But when I lift the load upward, I, I do the, some work, but this work can be can be returned it can be used again it's it's not it's not it does not disappear so there are two different situations uh, first when there are no forces of friction when i just lift 
the load upward and there are no forces of friction here, then the work done can be used later. And that's why the, the, the energy of the load is called potential energy because it's, it's potentially available for future use. But if there are some forces of friction, like here on the table, then the work done disappears. It cannot be used later. I, I do this work and it, never, it can never be returned. So for the case of simplicity, I will consider originally only, only such cases when there are no forces of friction for simplicity. Yes, it's possible. Yes, we will consider friction later. But uh, to begin with, we for the beginning, we consider the most simple situation when there are no forces of friction. And so the work done can be used later. It can be returned. Uh, it does not disappear. OK. If there are no forces of friction, then assume this load is on the smooth surface without any friction. And I apply force. And the load M, what does it do if the force is applied and there are no friction? There is no friction. There will be an acceleration of this load according to the second Newton's law. If, if there are no, no forces of friction and only one force is applied F, that is the force from an external agent, just like me, I'm just pushing this load with constant force. And if there, there is no friction, then the load will accelerate. It will go at some distance s with some acceleration. So the distance covered, well, let it be d distance, it will go with some acceleration. <coughs> And the acceleration is, according to Newton's second law, defined as force divided by mass. So in this case, uh, force is equal m a and acceleration a by definition it's a physical quantity which has definition and by definition it's the change of velocity over the time interval during which this velocity change took place and the change of velocity Generally, that is the final velocity minus the initial velocity in some time interval. So I can take this expression for, for the force and substitute it here in order to consider the work, the expression for work in detail. So work will be, in this particular case, it will be equal to a velocity final minus velocity initial divided by delta t times d. And d is the displacement. And how can we, how can we express the displacement if the body moves with uniform acceleration, with uniform acceleration. So the initial velocity was maybe zero, maybe some small velocity. And there will be a final velocity at this point, most probably a larger velocity, uh, because the, the load moves with acceleration. But anyway, the distance covered can be expressed as some mean velocity mean velocity 
by time interval. And mean velocity is just the initial velocity plus final velocity divided by 2. The mean velocity times delta t and the mean velocity in case of uniform acceleration, in case of, uh, in case the acceleration of motion is constant. In this case, this is just the initial velocity plus final velocity divided by 2. So in this formula, instead of d, I may use this expression, initial velocity plus final velocity divided by 2. This is the mean velocity and times delta t. Delta t will cancel in this formula. And using well-known algebraic uh, transformations, we can, we can write this expression as v final squared minus v initial squared. If you make this simple algebraic uh, calculations here, you will easily obtain this formula. Velocity final squared, because this velocity final multiplied by this velocity final will give you velocity final squared. And this minus velocity initial and plus velocity initial, when you multiply, you will obtain minus velocity initial squared. All other terms, cross products here, will, will cancel. And this is m velocity final squared over 2 minus m velocity initial squared over 2. This expression mv squared over 2 is called a kinetic energy. It's just the name for this expression. So this is kinetic energy final, and this is kinetic energy initial at the initial moment of time. So this is the initial moment of time when the body was here. That's the initial moment in time, and that is final moment in time. So when the body was here at this place, it had some initial velocity, v initial. And so mv initial squared divided by 2 will be the kinetic energy of this body at the initial moment of time. And then when the body moves here to its final point of destination with some constant acceleration under the action of constant force, then the velocity will be different here at this point. It will be a final velocity, and the body will have, the body will possess some kinetic energy, some final kinetic energy at the final point. So this expression is called a kinetic energy, and I will denote it by k. Therefore, what we have obtained, work done equals final kinetic energy minus initial kinetic energy. So if we do some work, then this work will be equal to the change in kinetic energy. That is the main conclusion. The work will be equal to the change in kinetic energy. Is this formula always correct? No, certainly not. It's not correct when I move the body along the table. Its initial velocity was 0, and final velocity now is 0. And kinetic energy doesn't change. It remains 0. So this formula does not apply to those situations when we have 
forces of friction of any kind. There may be liquid friction, or dry friction, or friction in, in the atmosphere, which is the air drag. So all sorts of friction should be excluded in order to have this formula correct. This formula holds only when there are no forces of friction. Now let's consider the situation which we have already discussed. The body is lifted upward to some height h, and so the work done equals mgh. And when I lift this body, I apply force mg to this load, and the force is directed upward, and the body moves upward, and I produce this work. But when the body goes down, well, suppose I just slowly put it on the table, back on the table surface, then the body acts with force mg and goes down the same distance h, and so the, the body produces the same work. So the work produced in this case is when the body goes from upper point to lower point. For example, when the body falls down, then it had some initial potential energy here. Well, let it be P initial. And final potential, eni final potential energy here, final potential energy. And we know that the initial potential energy was mgh, and final potential energy was 0 if we uh, calculate the height from this level. If we measure the height starting from this zero level, then the final potential energy will be again mgh, but h is zero here at this position. So that will be zero. Anyway, the difference in potential energies will be initial potential energy minus final potential energy. So in the first formula, we express the work using the change of kinetic energy of a body. For example, the body falling down from height h. We express the work through the change of kinetic energy of a body. And here, in the second formula, we introduced the notion of potential energy of a body, potential energy at some height, we introduce this notion, and we understand that the same work produced by falling body will be equal to initial potential energy minus final. Why initial minus final? Because initial is larger and final is zero, it's smaller. So if the body falling down produces some work, this work is positive because the gravity force is directed downward and the body moves downward, so it produces positive work. And in order to obtain positive quantity, we must uh, subtract small quantity, final potential energy, from the larger quantity, the initial potential energy. So in this case, we obtain positive, positive numbers, some positive value for work. But these two. Uh, formulas, these two expressions for work, allow one to say that final kinetic energy minus initial kinetic energy equals initial potential energy minus final potential energy. And that means that initial potential energy plus initial kinetic energy of the body must be equal to final potential energy plus the final uh, kinetic energy, final kinetic energy. That is the same formula rewritten after we move some terms from one side of the equation to another side. What does it mean? 
It means that the sum of potential energy and kinetic energy at the first moment of time will be equal to the sum of potential energy of the same body plus kinetic energy of the same body at some final moment of time. It means that the sum of potential energy plus kinetic energy for the body remains constant as the body moves without friction under the action of external forces. Potential energy plus kinetic energy of any body actually remains constant if there are no forces of friction or no, no air drag. N nothing like no, no, no forces which cause the energy or the work to, to disappear. Like in this case, when I move the, the body, I do some work, but this work is disappears. It cannot be returned. It cannot be returned. We cannot force this body to produce the same amount of work on its back way. But if I lift the body, I do some work, and this work can be done by the body if it falls down. So in this direction, there are no forces of friction. But in this direction, in our case here, there are forces of friction. So this formula can be used when there are no forces of friction, that is, when the body goes in the atmosphere, we neglect the air drag. But if the body moves uh, along the surface with the friction, then this formula will be incorrect. The sum of potential energy plus kinetic energy is called a total mechanical energy of a body. This is the total mechanical energy. And this law is formulated in this way. Total mechanical energy is conserved if there are no forces of friction. Total mechanical energy of a body is conserved. That is, it remains constant if there are no forces of friction. This is the law of conservation of mechanical energy. Very important law in physics, a law of conservation of mechanical energy. For simplicity, we considered this law uh, using one body. We imagined that there was one body moving, but actually, if there is uh, not a single body, if there are several bodies, two or three or more bodies, then the same will be true. Because each body will have its own potential energy and its own kinetic energy. And the same consideration will lead you to this final conclusion that the total mechanical energy for a system of bodies should also be uh, constant, should also remain constant in time. So this is the law of conservation of mechanical energy, not only for a single body, but for a system of interacting bodies. Again, I repeat you that this law is very powerful. It's very important. It's very good. It's very useful. You can use it to solve a lot of problems. But this law works only when you have no forces of friction in your problem. The law of conservation of mechanical energy. Now, what happens if there are forces of friction? What happens if you have some forces of friction? Then the mechanical energy will not be conserved. It will be lost. For example, I can move this body at some velocity, initial velocity, and so there was some initial kinetic energy. But then this kinetic energy is lost. The velocity is diminished to zero because of the forces of friction. Well, and the mechanical energy is not conserved, obviously. The kinetic energy is lost here in this situation. The motion of the body is retarded, and the body stops. That is the kinetic energy. Uh, the initial kinetic energy, which was positive, then remains zero, and it's lost. I cannot return it. I cannot use it again. So, but what, what changes in this situation? The kinetic energy is lost. But does anything, anything else change here? Certainly, if you measure the temperature of this body, you will discover that the more friction is applied to the body, the higher will be its temperature. The temperature of the body is increasing with uh, 
increasing in time if there are forces of friction. The friction causes the body to increase its temperature. You know it very well if you, if you, if you rub your, your palms of your hands, then you will obviously notice that the temperature of your palms becomes higher. So friction increases temperature. And temperature is related to internal energy, because temperature, you will learn it in greater detail in the third semester when you will learn molecular physics and thermodynamics. You will learn and you will study in greater detail that temperature is related to the motion of chaotic motion of atoms and molecules. And so temperature is related to the internal energy of this body. So if the temperature increases, it means that the internal energy is increased. And what we, what we observe, that the kinetic energy, initial kinetic energy associated with the initial velocity of this body <laughs> is lost when the body stops, but all this initial kinetic energy is transferred, is converted into the internal energy of this body because its temperature slightly increases. So the total amount of energy remains constant. If kinetic energy is decreased due to due to friction, then by the same amount, the internal energy will increase. And the total amount of energy in the closed system will remain constant. For, for a long time, people were not sure that this is true. For a long time, people made hundreds and maybe thousands of experiments to, to check this uh, situation. Where does the mechanical energy actually goes into, uh, into adequate amount of heat energy, of internal energy. And by in many experiments, people discovered that, yes, that's exactly so. If you lose in mechanical energy, for example, in kinetic energy, then the, the same amount of energy will, will be found increasing the internal energy of the, of the body. So the total energy of the system is always constant. Total energy which is defined as the mechanical energy, well, let it be T plus internal energy, plus internal energy, internal energy of the body. And the mechanical energy is just potential energy plus kinetic energy. So the total energy is constant for a system of bodies. Because if you lose some amount of mechanical energy, which is potential plus kinetic, then the same amount of lost energy here will appear here in the second term. It will increase the internal energy of the system of bodies, so that the total energy is constant in time. And this is called the law of conservation of energy, general law of conservation of energy, when people say that total energy is conserved. So mechanical energy is conserved only when you have no forces of friction. But if you have forces of friction, mechanical energy is not conserved, because a part of mechanical energy goes into, is tran tran converted into internal energy. But the total energy, which is mechanical plus internal, is conserved, which, which has been established in many, many experiments. So the law of conservation, general law of conservation of energy, is a generalization of many experimental facts. Is this law always correct in any situation? The total energy is conserved in any situation always. Is it correct? No. It's correct only for a closed system of bodies. What is the closed system of bodies? Any system of bodies which does not interact with the external world. You choose any system of bodies which does not interact with the external bodies. And interactions are only internal. Then this closed system of bodies, yes, that, will, that law will, be, will apply to a closed system of bodies which do not interact with the external world. For a closed system of bodies, the total energy is constant. The mechanical energy may be reduced, but in this case, the internal energy in the system of bodies will increase. 
and the total energy will be conserved for a closed system of bodies. But if the system of bodies is not closed, if there are some external forces acting on this system of bodies, then external forces will change the pot potential and kinetic energy, mechanical energy will be changed by external agents, and the total energy will not be conserved, certainly. So the law of conservation of total energy in physics applies only to a closed system of bodies, <coughs> onto a closed system, mm -hmm. closed system of bodies. So that is as far as the work and energy, as far as the work and energy are conserved. So another important thing, suppose this table has no friction. Well, assume, assume there are no forces of friction here. It's absolutely smooth, like the surface of ice, for example. And this body, if it moves initially, then will continue moving, continue moving without friction. Imagine such situation. And the body is moving without friction, and I will act with it, with, on it with some force. And if this force is directed at some angle to its velocity. I, I can act with attain, at any direction. I can choose to act on this body to retard its velocity or to increase its velocity. Or I can choose to act perpendicularly to the velocity or at any arbitrary angle. What will happen? So imagine this is the surface of the table without friction. And the body is here on the surface of the table. And it moves at some initial velocity in this direction. In case I choose to act on this body with a force perpendicular to the velocity, this is the vector, and this is the vector. If this angle is 90 degrees, then will this force change the velocity? No. The velocity will just change its direction the direction will change, but the magnitude of this vector will not change. So the perpendicular force will not change the velocity, the magnitude of velocity. It will change only the direction. And if I apply perpendicular force, the body will move not along the straight line, but along some curved line if the force is always acting perpendicularly to, to the velocity. Velocity is here, and the force is here. So the force, perpendicular force, does not change the velocity. It changes the, the magnitude of velocity. It changes only the direction of velocity. But do we have any direction here in this formula? No. This is a scalar quantity. It bears no information on the vector, uh, on the direction of vector of velocity. The n this is a scalar quantity. It's, uh, it's the same regardless of where, uh, wh what is the direction of vector v. Vector v may be directed in this direction, or may be directed southward, or may be directed eastward. Anyway, mv squared has the same value. It does not depend on direction. So this is a scalar quantity. And if it's a scalar quantity, then the change in the direction of velocity will not change this quantity. The kinetic energy will remain the same. This is the kinetic energy of a body. The kinetic energy will not be influenced by a perpendicular force. And if perpendicular force does not change the kinetic energy, then the perpendicular force does not produce any work. If kinetic energy does not change, then the final kinetic energy equals the initial kinetic energy, then that will give you zero, and the work done is zero if the force is perpendicular to the velocity. If the force is perpendicular to the velocity. So in case there is arbitrary vector of velocity and arbitrary vector of force, then we may consider two components of this force, 
the first component parallel to the velocity and the second component perpendicular to the velocity. And we have just concluded that the perpendicular component of the force, uh, this is the force certainly F, the perpendicular component does not change the kinetic energy of, of the body. Only the parallel component of the force may change the velocity and hence the kinetic energy. Five minutes interval. <coughs> So, after this short break, uh, we recall that we established a very important thing. If an arbitrary force is acting on a body, then only one component of this force will do work and change the body's energy. Only the component which is parallel to the velocity. So, if I want to write a formula for work I and I want to take into account the vector character vector uh, property of forces then I have no right to say that this is force 
times displacement. That definition of work, which is just force times displacement, that uh, is very simple, and that is that was the first step, the first step in discussion. Now we discover that this formula is not quite correct. It cannot be used always. It can be used only in case when the vector force is collinear with the displacement. That is, when the force is parallel to the displacement and or parallel to the velocity. Then this formula is correct. But in case the force is directed uh, at some arbitrary direction, then I will have to take, that is some angle alpha, I will have to take only the parallel component of force, which is directed along the displacement. I, I have to ignore the perpendicular component because it does not change the, the velocity of the body. And it th therefore, it does not change the kinetic energy. And therefore, it does not produce work. Work, if kinetic energy is not changed, if this term equals this term, then the work will be zero. So the perpendicular component of force does not do any work, or does no work at all. This perpendicular component should be ignored in this formula. In this formula, we must take into account only the parallel component of force directed along the displacement. And the parallel component, if we know the force and if we know the angle alpha, then the parallel component may be uh, written as the magnitude of the force f times cosine alpha. So this is more general and more precise definition of work. Work A is not merely force times distance. It's force times distance and times cosine alpha, where alpha is the angle between the direction of the force and the direction of displacement of this body. That is a more precise formula. So when we discuss any physical concept like work, we start from very simple considerations and very simple and primitive uh, formulas. And then when considering this concept in greater detail, we discover that the initial approach was correct, but very limited. And we must improve the initial formula. We must change it in some way in order to obtain a more precise and more correct formula, which can be applied in a more general case, not only when the force is uh, collinear with the displacement, but also when the force is directed at an arbitrary angle alpha to the displacement of the body. Sometimes for the case of brevity, uh, to be short, to put the formulas in a shorter way, people write this formula in this way. This is vector f times vector d. And in order to underline that this is a not simple product, but the product which involves cosine alpha, People say people put here a dot and say that this is a dot product of two vectors. This is a dot product. Or in 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 other words, this is a scalar product of two vectors. So in order to express this idea that there is a cosine alpha involved in the formula, just to put it in a short way, just to put it short, people say people people just put here a dot which implies that there is cosine alpha, just for, for brevity. Uh, and people, people name it a dot product of two vectors, or scalar product. What do these words mean? Nothing more but the fact that there should be cosine alpha. This is just to make formulas uh, shorter. So a uh, work is actually defined as a dot product of two vectors or a scalar product. And in that means that we have to take into account 
uh, the direction of the force and the cosine of the angle between the direction of the force and the direction of displacement. That's it. That's all there is to it. Well, let's now consider again the motion of a body when it moves, when it slides down an inclined surface. So I will consider some inclined surface or a slope at angle alpha and the body here which was at the initial position and then the body slides down with some acceleration on the body of mass m slides down without friction slides down the slope what happens in this case there is a force applied to this body which is a force of gravity mg and there is some angle between this force and the direction of displacement of the body so this force will produce some work according to the formula which we have just discussed and the total work produced by force of gravity when the body moves from initial point to its final point when the body moves from here to here, the total work will be what? The force of gravity F times displacement. And displacement is the distance between these two points. And now we know that the force, the force this is not the force of gravity. This is the component of the force of gravity along the displacement. That is force F. And in order to use the force of gravity, we have to put it this way. Mg, force of gravity, and the component uh, of this force will be calculated geometrically if this angle is alpha, then that will be the angle alpha here. And the component of force F will be mg sine alpha. This, this will be mg sine alpha. So that is the parallel component of the force times displacement, times distance. And distance between the initial point and final point can be expressed using the height h because height h divided by distance by definition is sine alpha h an opposite leg in this right triangle an opposite leg divided by hypotenuse by definition will be sine alpha so from here from here, we can obtain that the distance covered by the body is the height h divided by sine alpha. So the distance here equals just this expression. And we finally obtain mg sine alpha. And instead of d, I will substitute h divided by sine alpha. h divided by sine alpha. So sine alpha will cancel here, and I will obtain mgh. That is for the work done by the forces of gravity when the body slides down from the initial point to final point along the slope without friction. mgh, we obtained this result as if the body fell down vertically from the initial point to this level. Because mgh is uh, the initial potential energy. We discussed it. This is obvious. This is just like definition force times displacement. If the body fall, falls down from the initial height 8 to zero height, then the force mg does this work force mg 
multiplied by displacement by height from which the body fell down. So MGH will be the work done by the force of gravity when the body falls down. And so this is the pot initial potential energy, the energy which may be released potentially if the body falls down. So when the body is at height H, it possesses this potential energy. And it, it may possess it for a long time, for days and weeks and months. And then after five years, it falls down and, and the work is released, it's, it's produced finally. The potential energy is transferred into, into the work produced. So the potential energy is stored at this height, stored by the body, and is preserved for a long time. And then it may be released when the body falls down. And if the body does not fall down vertically, but slides down along the slope without friction, then the same work is done. And it does not depend on the angle alpha. Any angle alpha of the slope, or this angle, or this angle, any angle will, you can use any, any slope at any angle to the horizontal. And the work done by the forces of gravity when the body slides down will be MGH anyway. It does not depend on alpha. And that, by the way, means that when the body is at the initial point, at some height h, and it slides down along the slope, the slope may have a variable inclination. The body may move along any any curve because uh, the work done by the forces of gravity or the loss of potential energy does not depend on angle alpha. At any angle alpha, the work, the uh, energy loss will be, will be defined by this formula. So we may use this result for any small any small displacement of the body along this curved slope. And here the slope can be maybe considered just like a part of the straight line. And again, here at this, at this section, we may consider this small part of the slope as a part of the straight line. And so for each such small section, we may apply the same consideration and we may obtain this important result that the loss of potential energy, the loss of potential energy, which is equal to mg delta h, when delta h is this small section, delta h is just the loss in the position of the body in vertical direction. And this loss of position will define the loss of potential energy, will, which will be equal to the work done by the forces of gravity, which will be converted to a kinetic energy of the body. So the body may, may slide down along arbitrary curve. Anyway, the loss of potential energy will be the same, mgh, when the body goes from the initial point to final point. The loss of potential energy will be MGH anyway, MGH, and that will be not merely the loss, that will be not merely the change in potential energy, but that will be the change in kinetic energy. The kinetic energy will increase. The final kinetic energy minus initial kinetic energy will be given by this formula. If, even if the body moves along an arbitrary slope, not necessarily the straight plane, So, now I would like to spend a few minutes to discuss 
other situation, other situations when uh, work is is done. For example, well, uh, this formula that work is force times displacement can be easily interpreted on the graph of function f as a function of coordinate x. So the displacement may be shown as uh, some initial position x initial and final position x final. So the displacement will be x final minus x initial. That section will be the displacement of the body. And if the force was constant, then the force as a function of displacement will be shown here by a horizontal straight line. And the work done will be equal to force, which is this section on the graph, times displacement. It means that the work done will be represented by the area of this uh, rectangular figure. So that will be the that will be the force that will be the work done by such force. So if you know the graph of force versus coordinate of the moving body, then the area under this under this graph will be equal to the work done in this process. Uh, this is very fruitful idea if for example, in many situations, for example, if I consider a spring and the body which can be displaced, and uh, for example, that was the initial position of the spring when it was not elongated. And then I attempt to elongate the spring and move the body here at this from this initial point to final point. So when I elongate the spring, which has stiffness k, the coefficient of stiffness of the spring, uh, I know that the force needed to elongate the spring, the force applied to the spring in order to stretch it, depends on the displacement on the coordinate x. If this is x, then the body has coordinate x at any moment of time. So the force versus, versus displacement will be a straight line, and the force will be proportional to displacement, a coefficient of stiffness times x from the initial zero position from the coordinate origin, which coincides with the uh, position of a spring, not elongated spring. <coughs> uh, so when I apply force, I can elongate the spring, I can stretch it, and the force will be proportional to the elongation of the spring. What work will be produced, or what, wh which work will be done by this force if I stretch the spring by distance x? If the, st the spring is stretched or elongated from zero position to some final position x, then what work is done here? Uh, I can recall this important observation that the force, that the work done equals the area under the uh, curve representing the dependence of force, uh, of force versus distance versus coordinate. Here I have the graph of force versus coordinate. So the work done in this process when the spring is elongated from zero position to some x, uh, position, and that is the elongation of the spring, is this one. The work done in this process will also be represented by the area of this figure, which is a right triangle. And so this is x, the, this leg equals x, and this leg equals f of x. And so the area of this triangle will be x times f of x divided by 2, because this is the area of a right triangle. The product of two legs over 2. That is the area of this figure, which must be equal to the work done. 
due to the definition of work. And so in this formula, x, and what is f, at f of x? f as a function of x is kx. So I obtain here kx over 2, and which gives me kx squared over 2. That is the formula for the work which I need to do in order to elongate the spring by some distance x, in order to stretch the spring so that it becomes longer by x centimeters. This is the work which is needed to elongate the spring. And if I stretch the spring to this position and then allow the spring to return back, the spring will, will do some work while moving this body. The spring will act with some force on this body, and the spring will do the work, the same amount of work. If we have no forces of friction here, if the body can slide without friction along the surface, then in the absence of forces of friction, the work produced by the spring will be the same which I have done while stretching the spring. So this is also a potential energy of the elongated spring, of the stretched spring. This is the potential energy of the spring. And also, certainly, it's equal to the work which the spring may do if it is allowed to return back to its neutral position. So in some problems, you will need this formula. And uh, now, after discussing these theoretical concepts, I would like to consider, I would like to consider some problems. But before we go to problems, I would like to remind you uh, of these very important conclusions which we have arrived at today. We have discussed the general law of conservation of energy. The energy is conserved. Is it always true? No. This is true only for closed systems. The total energy of a closed system of bodies, which is the sum of mechanical energy plus internal energy, this total energy remains constant if the system of bodies is closed, which means that there are no interactions between these bodies and the outside world. Then the total energy is conserved. This is a very important law of physics. But it, it's, it can be applied only to a closed system of, body, of bodies. If you have an open system of bodies rather than a closed one. In the open system, when there are interactions with the external world, <laughs> no, no energy will be conserved. Absolutely. It will be changed in time because the external world may either take the energy out of the system or pump energy into the system. That's very simple. So the law of conservation of energy is, is true. It's valid only for closed system of bodies. If there are no frictions, uh, no forces of friction, then the internal energy will not change. There will be no heating of bodies. And then in this case, the mechanical energy T will be conserved. And mechanical energy equals potential energy plus kinetic energy. <coughs> this mechanical energy is just the part of the total energy. And this part of the total energy will be conserved if the internal energy is not changed in the process. And the eternal, internal energy is not changed if there are no forces of friction. So in the absence of friction, only the first term in this formula will be conserved, which is the mechanical energy. Mechanical energy, the law of conservation of mechanical energy is also very important, but it, it can be applied only when there are no forces of friction. So any law in physics has a limited domain of applicability. Any law in physics. There are no universal laws which are applicable always, regardless of circumstances. No, no such laws. Any law can be applied only within its domain of applicability. 
then the law works and gives, produces excellent results. But if you, if you attempt to apply a law somewhere outside the domain of its applicability, somewhere in conditions when this law is not applicable, and you will try to apply it, you will obtain wrong result. You will obtain a mistake. That's it. So let's consider some problems. <clears throat> Well, the same, the same considerations are true for not only in physics, the same considerations about the area of applicability of any concept is true in, in everyday life, not only in physics, in, in any other field of uh, human activity. For example, in politics. Uh, for example, uh, uh, democracy. Is it always applicable? Yes, it's applicable, it, it works good, it works excellently, but not always. Try to apply democratic forms of government, uh, democratic forms in the army. Total failure, total. Democracy cannot be applied and cannot be used in the army. Absolutely not. So even, even such things as democracy have different domain of applicability, or limited domain of applicability limited domain. You can use it here, but you cannot use it in other situations. It will not work. It will give you wrong result. So uh, this is a general approach, not only in physics, but also in any, any field of human activity. So uh, work and energy. <coughs> uh, problem number 120. What work will be performed if a force of Three kilogram forces, three kilogram force is used to lift a load of one kilogram. So we have a mass of one kilogram. There is a misprint in this uh, collection of problems here, but I will, I will correct it. The mass is one kilogram. Well, we lift it at a height of five meters. So that's what given in the problem, uh, we need to calculate work. What work is done by a force of three kilogram forces when we, use, when we lift the mass of one kilogram using this force at a height of five meters? So there was a body M of mass M, and we lift it at a height of five meters at a given height so that will be the final position of the body. And we apply force F to lift the body up. And the force is given three kilogram force. What does it mean kilogram force? I already, already explained. We discussed it. A one kilogram force is a force which is needed to, su to support a load of one kilogram mass. So if you have a load of one kilogram mass, that seems to be one. I don't know, maybe, maybe, maybe three kilograms, I don't know. Uh, but if, if this is one kilogram, then the force ne needed to support it is just one uh, kilogram force. So one kilogram force, by definition, one kilogram force is the mass of one kilogram times acceleration of free fall uh, meters per second squared and so this is 9.8 Newton. One kilogram force, if we convert this unit to, uh, to an international system of units, you obtain 9.8 Newtons. So the force is given. Certainly this is approximately 10 Newtons, approximately. The force is given. It's uh, three times 10, that is 30 Newtons. We act with such force of 30, approximately 30 newtons on the body of mass one kilogram, and we lift it at height of five meters. What work is performed? 
what work is done here? Well, we have a definition. We have a definition of physical quantity work. And while considering this quantity and while solving problems involving the work, we must use the definition, certainly. We, we don't have to use any other formula. Use this, just the formula given to you as a definition. So the work by definition is force times displacement. Here, the, here is the simplest situation when the force uh, is directed along the displacement, the directions coincide, so we don't, we don't have to take into account any cosine alpha. Uh, the direction of the force coincides with the displacement, so that will be simply force times displacement h. And the force is 30 newtons times h, which is 5 meters. And so that will be 150 newtons per meter which is 150 joules. That is the answer to this simple problem. Did we use the mass of the body one kilogram? No, we didn't use it. Why do they give you this quantity? the mass of one kilogram. Well, very simple. Uh, they give you this mass for two reasons. First, to distract your attention and to complicate your life. This is an extra quantity which is given to you, and we don't need this quantity to solve the problem. We need just the force and the displacement and nothing more. We don't need the mass. The answer will be obtained by multiplying force times displacement. We don't need this mass. It's given to you as some superfluous quantity. But there is another reason behind this, this quantity. It's given to you actually so that you can analyze the situation. Suppose the mass was 100 kilogram or one ton. 1,000 kilograms, then could you lift it up to a height of 5 meters by using just this uh, small force? No. If the mass is too large and the body is too heavy, the force applied will be unable to lift the body at 5 meters. So you can lift the body upward only if the force applied is large enough and the mass is small enough so that you can lift the body. If the mass is very large, you, you will be unable to lift it, and the problem will be senseless. There will be no answer at all. You may apply force, and the body is so heavy that you will, not, you will be unable to, to move the body. So the work produced will be zero because the displacement will be zero. If the mass is too large, and you will be unable to displace the body to move it even at a millimeter. So the work done will be zero. And in order to obtain non-zero work, you have to be sure that the body is not too heavy, the mass is not too large, so that you can uh, lift this body without problems. <coughs> uh, so uh, which masses can be, can be lifted using such force of three uh, of 13 newtons, 13 newtons. So this is mg, and mass from here, if this is exactly 13 newtons, is just the force which can lift the body without acceleration, at small velocity without any acceleration, then the mass will be equal to force divided by g, and force is 13 newtons divided by 10, approximately 10, uh, 10 meters per, per second squared, and that will be three. That will give you three kilograms. So if you have a load of three kilogram mass, you will be quite well able to lift it up without any acceleration, slowly, with such a force of 13 newtons. You will be able, approximately three kilograms, actually just a little bit, a little bit smaller because this is not uh, 10, this is 9.8. Anyway, 
if, if the mass is larger than three kilograms, you will be unable to lift it with such a force of, five, uh, of 30 newtons. You will be unable to lift it. We have a mass of one kilogram well below this uh, critical level. Our mass in this problem is much smaller, three times smaller. So we will be quite able to lift this body using this force. And obviously, this force will move the body with acceleration. And we can even calculate the final velocity here, the final velocity of this body, because it will move upward with acceleration. This is a very simple problem to apply Newton's second law. You can find acceleration and final velocity of this body. But the mass is given merely for the purpose of analyzing the situation and concluding that this body can well be lifted up. It's not too heavy. It's OK. It can be lifted up. So, but the mass is not required to find the final uh, solution to, to make all the calculations. So another problem. OK. 134. How should the power of a pump motor change if the pump, uh, uh, for the pump to deliver twice as much water in a unit of time through a narrow orifice? Disregard friction. So we have a pump which pumps water. And the pump, well, you may imagine the situation. There is a water reservoir. And here is a pipe and the pump, which pumps water. And uh, the pump's water and water f f flows from here is pumped upward, for example. And this way. And there is a diameter. Here is the diameter of the pipe, of the outlet of this, of this pipe, the diameter D. And it says, how should the power of the pump motor change. So what is the power? We have not discussed. I have forgotten about it. Well, if we produce some work, we can do it in certain time interval. If we produce this work slowly, it will take us a large time. If I move this body slowly, it will take me minutes to, to move it at large distance. But if I move it very quickly, then in a short time interval, the same amount of work will be produced. The same amount of work. So power, by definition, is the amount of work done at some time interval. And it's measured in joules divided by second. And this unit is called watt. Again, large capital. Uh, uh, capital letter, because this is after a name of a scientist. OK, this is just the definition of power, a work produced in some time interval, in certain time interval. And if I move slowly, then the power will be, will be small. But if I do the same amount of work in a short interval of time, and I do this quickly, then the power released will be large. So on this point, Let's finish this lecture. And we will continue this problem next time. And next time, most probably, you will study distantly because the institute mm, is expected to be closed due to this pandemic. And uh, the nearest three lectures will be distant. And then, again, I, I hope you, you, will have, you will be able to return here. OK. Let's finish on this point.